So when Starmer was first elected leader of the Labour Party, he said his number one priority was to repair relationships with the Jewish community. Uh, there was also, you know, another difficult issue um, that had caused some problems to the last Labour leadership in at least the 2019 general election, which was relationships with big bodies uh, of the Hindu Indian community. It was sort of reported from lots of often marginal constituents. So, for example, East Harrow, where I went around, there were many people who were of Hindu Indian origin who were traditional Labour voters who weren't voting Labour this time. And that was because of their position on Kashmir. Uh, the background here is when tensions arose last summer, and that was in response to, well, that was because uh, Narendra Modi had basically suspended uh, the autonomy of Kashmir, which had been historically guaranteed, locked down that region from having any contact with the outside world, sent in the military some real you know, nasty human rights abuses um, from a really nasty leader. Uh, at Labour Party conference, there was an emergency motion passed um, to condemn these actions, but it also committed the Labour Party to accept that Kashmir is a disputed territory and the people of Kashmir should be given the right of self-determination in accordance with UN resolutions. Um, that was seen um, by some people to be anti-Indian uh, and caused some of those problems on the doorstep this morning. Keir Starmer, so in a bid to you know, solve this problem, uh, met with Labour friends of India and, I mean, brought about a real reverse of Labour policy. Let's go to a statement uh, that he made after that meeting. So he says, we must not allow issues of the subcontinent to divide communities here. Fair enough. Any constitutional India's any constitutional issues in India are a matter for the Indian parliament and Kashmir is a bilateral issue for India and Pakistan to resolve peacefully. Labour is an internationalist party and stands for the defence of human rights everywhere. Now, you know, the, the, the difference between those statements is very clear. One talks about the right to self-determination and the other drops that. Um, but I mean, the most controversial thing here is it's not even a, a statement that sits on the fence. You know, it's not saying that Labour will try and bring people together and, and talk to all sides in this conflict. It's taking a very strong position and a very strong pro-Modi position, which is that the constitutional settlement for Kashmir will be decided in the Indian parliament, uh, which, you know, is, is a very odd understanding of how you defend minorities is to say, oh, well, it'll be decided in a parliament where, they, where, where the majority wants to occupy and, and remove the autonomy of Kashmir. I mean, to me, it just seemed... It was a very right-wing statement, wasn't it, Aaron? Yeah, it was phenomenally right-wing. I, I understand, again, often if people criticise Starmer, people go, oh, this is this is the left, you know, uh, get real. This isn't, you know, Jeremy Corbyn being the leader anymore. But it was a really odd, incoherent statement. Maybe we can actually pull it back up and I'll just go through an inconsistency you literally see between the two lines. Uh, it says, on the one hand, you can see here, um, Kashmir is a bilateral issue for India and Pakistan to resolve peacefully. Uh, and then it says, literally the next sentence, Labour is an internationalist party and stands for defence of human rights everywhere. Now, human rights are covered under international law. And yet you're saying in the previous sentence that this is an issue which is to be determined uh, by India and Pakistan bilaterally, i.e. between them as two sovereign nations. So either this is an issue uh, within the constraints of international human law, which it is, by the way, uh, as is uh, issues surrounding self-determination, or it's purely an issue between two sovereign powers, I, India and Pakistan. It, it can't be both of those things. It's like saying that Crimea is between Ukraine and Russia as two sovereign states. Who says that? No, you would say, we, as an international community, we respect the sovereignty, sovereignty of nations. That's the first thing. So you'd say, well, Russia shouldn't be going in there. But then if, if you had a, a, a legitimate referendum there, as you had, had for instance, in, in Kosovo, the majority of people in Kosovo wanted an independent nation state uh, which uh, eventually broke away from the former Yugoslavia. You say, well, these people have a right to self-determination. And, and yet this, this, this entire, this entire mm. corpus of international law, this guy's a human rights lawyer, has just been jettisoned. It's, it's added on as like a little kind of, a little kind of uh, garnish at the end. Of course, we're an international party. We respect human rights law. We've just said it's purely a bilateral issue between two sovereign states. So obviously you don't think that. 
Uh, and it's about, if you take human rights seriously, it has to inform policy. It's not just a garnish. It's not just a, a sort of a superficial thing you put on top. It's not some icing on the cake. It should be at the heart of the policy. Mm. Really, really surpri it surprised me because Starmer's a human rights lawyer. This is a guy who's been campaigning for years and years and years to end the death penalty in various countries around the world. You know, I would have thought on an issue like this, he'd actually be very good, which leads me to suspect he didn't write this or, you know, the policy isn't necessarily his. I think something that right wing probably has come from somebody in his office who has quite different politics. I don't know, because it just showed a complete disinterest in in ideas of universality and human rights and the and the universal right to self-determination. Uh, really shocking to see it. I mean, you're, you're, you're totally right about the inconsistency there, because he says he's talking about internationalism. But what he's done there is a really traditional realist response to international Precisely. relations, which is to basically say what happens in that nation is their issue. Uh, and also, basically, I mean, later in the letter, he talks about how we're going to strengthen trade with India, etc. You don't want to upset the, the the sovereign government of India. So what they do with their minority communities, that's up to them. Right? That, that's a realist position. It's not an internationalist position. Um, so it is disappointing. And I have to say, I mean, because one thing I thought Keir Starmer would potentially be quite good at, especially in, you know, contradiction to someone like Tony Blair, is he does, well, I assumed he was someone who sort of cared about human rights and potentially about international relations. Mm. Uh, we've often said that he, you know, he doesn't seem to have a very strong position when it comes to political economy, but that's fine if what his passion is, is about defending human rights. And that's an important, you know, that's an important obsession of a Labour leader. But if you look at this letter, which is one of his first moves, really, mm. as, as a Labour leader, one of his first concrete policy stances he's taken, it runs completely roughshod over the human rights of the Kashmiri people. So, I mean, I hope you're right in that it's just some, you know, lowly advisor and Keir Starmer will, will, will change tack here. And that's not necessarily even to say that he, he has to commit to the previous Labour policy. I think the idea that the, for Labour to say we stand 100% in terms of self-determination for Kashmir, I mean, they haven't said that about Catalonia, for example. Yeah. You can have a more sort of almost wishy-washy statement where you're sort of like, we respect the rights of the people of Kashmir to determine, et cetera, et cetera, but we also yeah. rec recognise the claims of India, blah, blah, yeah. blah. Do you know what I mean? You can have a sort of wishy-washy one. But this isn't wishy-washy. This is coming down very concretely mm. on the side of the Modi government. Yeah, this is not fence-sitting. You know, fence-sitting has its place in politics. You know, ultimately, you, the argument could be made, this isn't going to be the policy. It's just, you know, it's to placate a certain interest group. By the way, Labour Friends of India aren't even affiliated to the Labour Party, which I just find absolutely remarkable. And, and the, this this press release earlier on today, I think we have to regain the trust of, of British Indians I mean, BAME communities just felt, voted in two elections in overwhelming numbers for the Labour Party. Labour's strongest vote in this country is BAME voters. Uh, and of course, you have to delimit you know, various um, communities. But I, I have met very few people from very few people from South Asia saying I'm not voting for Labour because of this issue. And I'm sure, well, I know for a fact it was a major issue in several seats. Uh, but regain the trust and it's just the way it's said it's been said in regards to british jewish community understandably there's a huge issue there but it's just the way it's just kind of cut copy paste onto this issue i was like this isn't the same thing and it just seems so um politically unstrategic and tactless as well as the policy itself being um in astute and i think just plain wrong and actually mm. just plain at odds with with the best bits of labor foreign policy over the last 30 years even if, even if you're, again, Blair was a liberal interventionist, right? Blair would say, we should go to Kosovo, we should go to Sierra Leone, heaven forbid, we should go to Iraq and Afghanistan because we believe in these universal rights. I think that's a terrible way to conduct foreign policy, but that, that, was, the, that was how he did things. But this idea that, oh, well, look, you can oppress this minority and it's purely about bilateral relations. And then you have the temerity to say at the end, well, actually, we're international, so we care about human rights law. Well, you, you patently don't. Sub the substantive content of that declaration is no different to what Donald Trump would say. And I, I'm not saying that to be facetious. Clearly, Keir Starmer is a much more progressive, intelligent political operator than, than Donald Trump. But in, 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 in content, the policy is no different. And that has to be really concerning, because like you say, it's, the, it's one of the first sort of foreign policy tests. Um, and it, it, if you're coming down on the side of Modi, uh, confronted with that first test, just to placate a small group of people who aren't even affiliated to the party, you have to worry, you know, how, how, how much backbone has this guy got to stand up for something uh, which he which he believes in as a politician? And we haven't seen it. And it's something we talked about previously. You know, he was director of public prosecutions. We've had a sort of um, uh, an audition for a guy being in an incredibly important national role where he'd be scrutinized 
in a way that almost nobody will ever understand as director of public prosecutions. How many risks did he take? How many big calls did he take and push back uh, against against perhaps the received wisdom? You know, none. Uh, this clearly is just taking the easy route uh, for the sake of placating somebody for the short term. And actually, in politics, that rarely works, particularly on the left. You're going to need a big strategic vision. You know, OK, foreign policy isn't the most important pressing issue right now, uh, but it's going to be a big one. And more missteps like that. And he's going to lose a lot of his base. Uh -huh.